Um, we're going to take it way down. This is my experience in one year's of course courses at one college. So we probably can't uh, generalize as much from what we're going to learn from me. Um, so this is work that I've done with a colleague at Carleton College, and this was our experience with starting <coughs> to flip or blend what happened in our Principles of Microeconomics course. So because it is late in the afternoon on the second day of the conference, if you have to leave right now, you can still learn something from me. That is, we feel like we shifted class time to be more engaging, more active, and fun for us and the students. And our assessment says that students learn just as much content and maybe even more, and especially maybe about some higher, higher level learning activities. So that's it. If you need to go, go ahead. <laughs> I want to let you know a little bit about you know, how did we do the flipping, the blending, because if I've learned anything in the past two days is that this word blending means very different things to, to many different people. So here's what we did, and that is you know, before class, we had the students read the textbook, and telling the students to read the textbook was um, they weren't all sure that they were really supposed to do that. Um, and because of textbooks, the textbook, we also you know, created some videos on some basic things that we would have been lecturing on in, in the course. And then, to, because we're economists, we want to make sure there was incentives for the students to actually do these things. So like we've seen in some other presentations, there, there is some homework and some quizzing. And this quizzing I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute was really helpful because that then determined how we spent class time. At the very beginning of class, it was all about following up on this homework. What do you need help on that I, can, that I learned from watching you, your homework? And then you know, maybe provide some mini lectures, but trying to spend as much time in class on the fun activities and discussion. There are even prizes. And so that was, again, this hook to get students to work on this other stuff outside of class. Because the more they did, the more time we had where you could earn prizes like candy and cupcakes and other things. Uh, but then also, there's this last thing. I'm, I'm glad we can see it above the table. I hope everybody can see it. And that is there were follow-up homeworks immediately. So almost every day, there were going to be two homework assignments due. One kind of pre the next class, and also one following up on, on the previous class. So that's the, the gist of, of what I did. Uh, we spent some time making some videos. Uh, I'm really happy to hear from Luke that students don't care about production quality because I've turned off the audio because even though you have to listen to me, I would be terrified to listen to myself again. So basic things that you know, I would be using you know, typically in class, thinking about making some keynote presentations. Uh, a great tool I learned about in keynote, I'm a math guy, magic move for making things move around on your slides. Highly recommend it. Check it out. Um, and then my approach to economics is, is not only, uh, I call it the economics tripod. So not only the basic intuition of what are we going to be doing, talking about you know, kind of some high level stuff, but then also, this is an economics class, so we're going to make you do some math. The math videos I have heard from students were really helpful, as we've heard in, in other sessions. The fact that students can you know, watch things over again. I've also found it helpful to you know, use some sort of technology to, for me to actually be writing out the math as opposed to just numbers popping up. So uh, other pro tip, uh, trying to separate your writing to create the animations in the video from your audio. For a long time, I was trying to write and talk <laughs> to create the video. I don't know how we do it in class because that's what we typically do in class, but for a video, write things out first, then do the voiceover afterwards. Unfortunately, it took me a really long time to figure that out. <laughs> so. And then finally, I, I really like making the videos where I can make some nice, clean graphs, again, with some animation. So trying to help students understand that, that math and intuition of what's going on when we implement a tax in a, in a single market. Additionally, I can provide some annotation again so they can see what it is I'm talking about, trying to reiterate what we've seen previously. Uh, lastly, I uh, just want to corroborate what other people have said. It's really hard to bring your videos down to be short enough that students will you know, watch the whole thing. So trying to make a, a short five, six, eight minute video 
first time, a couple times through, I just just started talking and then looked up and it's 45 minutes later and <laughs> that's not going to work. And finally, you know, my, my penmanship is, is terrible and so I love the fact that I can, you know, make a video and finish with some nice, clear, and clean, uh, you know, computer generated graphic or trying to help students understand. So again, trying to move the lecture to outside of the class and I think making the lecture better than what I could do on the fly with a typical chalk and talk. Then, other external resources were really important for us. So we, we spent some time making some videos. Uh, the homework, we decided to use a, a third party uh, service called Sapling Learning. Some people may have heard about it. Uh, but that's where we had the homework. And this is a, a, a service that students have to pay for. So it's about $30 per student <coughs> per term. We're on trimesters at Carleton, so they might charge you a little bit more if you're on semesters. But that prompted a, a big discussion amongst my, my colleagues and I about if we're going to make them pay for this, then throwing on a typical you know, new latest edition microeconomics textbook that, you know, they're in the hundreds of dollars these days. So we switched to an open source textbook. Uh, and those are the authors there. X, OpenStax, just a, a plug for the OpenStax project. They're doing some really cool things. And you have a chance to actually uh, customize their text to put things in the order that you want for your courses. So we ended up with a textbook that really did fit with what we were going to cover. Sapling has worked with OpenStax as well, so these homework assignments looked very similar, used some similar terminology um, as, as the textbook. And I got to make those videos in, in the places where I wanted students to go a little bit deeper or just provide a little bit more context. One of the reasons I really loved Sapling for the homework is you've seen and you've heard from me already that in economics, we're going to be working with graphs, right? We're going to be doing things with the graph. And so the fact that Sapling could ask questions of students that go beyond just the typical kind of online multiple choice questions, right? Or type in a number, but that you could actually work with the graph and move things around and find areas on a graph. This is really important for us economists, right? We love finding areas on graphs. These are really, really important. <laughs> So when the sapling demo showed me that we could do things like this, um, I was hooked. <laughs> Additionally, one of the things I really liked about sapling is that you, know, you get this instant feedback. Right? You type in your answer, you hit submit, and you see that you're correct. Or you see that you're not correct, and the folks at sapling have different sets of feedback depending on what your answer was. So there's a kind of a general feedback, hey, like something went wrong, try it again. But also, had I you know, highlighted a, a certain area that's a common mistake, some feedback pops up that says, hey, you didn't get it correct. Are you sure you're thinking about it this way instead of this other way? You can retry. Right? And so that, I think, is great. All right. Then for me, right, so students have supposedly read the textbook, <laughs> watch my videos, which again I can check on because I'm putting the, the videos inside our course management software so I can see who's been clicking on the videos. They have to do these homework assignments before class, and they're usually due a couple hours before class, which then allows me to check on, you know, look at the gradebook <coughs> for these homework assignments. And this is just, this is brilliant for me, right? The fact that I don't have to do the grading first of all, but then I can see the you know, how students did for these various questions. So, you know, red is bad, green is good, I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind, <laughs> but you can see the score here. So here's a student who really struggled, right, and this is great. I'll bring this up in office hours when a student comes in to wonder why they're not doing so well in class. I can show them, you know, that I can see their solutions. I can see for each question, what did they submit as their answer? I can look at how many times <laughs> they tried it. And I'm not sure if you can see from the back, but there's even some hatching here. It's possible to give up on a question and see the solution. Mm -hmm. So this student right, was struggled with number six, did great on everything else, and after they struggled, they wanted to know what the solution was. This student struggled with half of the questions and never even bothered to look to see what the solution was. Great data, great data. <laughs> and so I would typically start class
showing students this view of this same homework assignment. And so it's not individual grades, but it's based on these different questions. I can see that you know, there are a couple people who didn't finish today's homework, and you know, a little bit of public shaming, <laughs> anonymously of course, but everybody else did the homework. And it also allows me to say, hey, you know what? We should really talk about number six and number eight. Number one, two, and three, Hey, no problem, you guys got that almost right away on your first try or maybe your second try, but people are struggling with number six and number eight. So let's go through and do these problems together to make sure everybody understands now what's happening. And then I might give a mini lecture, but at that point I feel like I'm lecturing on things that people are actually struggling with and not boring the people who um, potentially did the reading. All right. So my hope, then, is that much of class time looks something like this. This is not my class, not even the, the classroom I'm in, but this is my kind of ideal situation for most of class time. It's students working together, drawing things on the board, talking things out, you know, being active in the classroom as opposed to just sitting there listening to me. So what are we doing when students are working. Well, we're going to be working through some more advanced problems. Right? We take those homework assignments that they've done and say, great, now that we all understand number six and number eight, let's take a slightly more complicated question that uses those concepts to make sure we really do understand that concepts and, and not just that <coughs> question, working in small groups. Additionally, I, this creates time in the classroom for some fun experiments. So, for instance, in microeconomics, a fundamental model of microeconomics is supply and demand. And so instead of just reading about, you know, this mythical supply and demand curves that exist out there, we have students <coughs> participate in a, a fictitious market in the classroom. So they're moving around, talking with each other, trying to buy and sell things. And then we have the, their data to talk about and our results from the simulation to talk about in contrast to what the textbook talks about and the ways in which it's always exciting for me as well to wonder is today the day I talk about how what happened in class is exactly consistent with the textbook mm -hmm. or is today the day where I have to talk about why things are more complicated than the textbook uh, put forward. Additionally, right, there's some great Excel uh, opportunities for students in, in economics. We're drawing graphs all the time. We want to know what happens as we change things. And so I can draw things on the board and start jumping around saying what would happen. But uh, Umberto Barreto is a professor at DePauw, and he's done some great, great work creating these Excel workbooks where students can play around, you know, move sliders and, and things move around. And that is just a great use of class time, in my opinion, for students to, to see what happens and they're making things happen. They're making things move around. It's not me. Right? Additionally, being an environmental economist, I created, a, we worked together to create an opportunity for students to talk about uh, tradable emissions permits. Again, another concept that students could read about and say, yep, totally understand that. Now let's actually participate in a simulation. Uh, where we actually see this stuff happen, very cool. As well as, there's a great old British game show from a couple of years ago called Golden Balls, where two people are making a decision to split or steal a jackpot. Great example of some uh, microeconomic concepts. So we can use that to say, look, economics is everywhere. <laughs> and one time I tried to move on before showing them the actual result, and there was a riot. <laughs> so we want to know what happened to see how this stuff applies. All right, so the changes we made, I certainly enjoyed. I think students enjoyed them in class as well. They seem to be having more fun. But the question that we had is, if we're spending all this time having fun in class, are students still learning the content? And so I, I really like this you know, Bloom's taxonomy, thinking about the, the higher levels of learning. But you know, we also want to make sure our colleagues know that our students are understanding the, the basic concepts of, of microeconomics before they leave our intro courses. So luckily for us in economics, there is a standardized test mm -hmm. called the Test of Understanding in College Economics. Mm -hmm. And it's a 30 question, multiple choice uh, exam. And so we decided to use this as a, as a measure of some basic content learning. 
right? It doesn't measure lots of things, but it measures some <coughs> basic content. So we decided to do this as a pre-test and a post-test. And we're at Carleton, and so the results from, from our students were different from the, the national data for the, the pre-test versus the post-test. National average is an increase of only three questions. Uh, we at Carleton saw an increase of 5.5, 5, 5, uh, again, out of 30. And so we know that our students are a little different than the average national Carleton or college student. So we did collect with the, the help of institutional research at Carleton some, some demographic data about our students. And so you can see you know, our Carleton students are really good at taking standardized tests, coming in there in the 93rd percentile. Some students have had some economics experience uh, either at Carleton or in high school. Uh, but we do have a, a good split of males and females. These are primarily freshmen in our, this was a year and a half ago. And importantly, there were no statistically significant differences across these variables for students who were in our flipped classes versus the control classes. Something I haven't told you yet <coughs> is that we thankfully had other Carleton faculty who teach principles of microeconomics who allowed us to test their students before and afterwards as well. So in addition to this TUS, we also used another instrument about student effort. We were a little worried about students might try harder on the exam on this uh, survey closer to the final exam uh, compared to the beginning of the course. But our basic conclusion is right, our treatment effect, we're gonna compare the learning gains from our control group versus the, the, treat, the treatment effect, or I'm sorry, the treatment group. And our students in our sections actually started a little bit below the control students and finished a little bit above. And this treatment effect actually seems to be statistically significant. Okay? So we were just wanted to make sure we weren't doing harm in fact, it seems those students seem to be learning a little bit more content, even though we're spending less time on content in class. And I'm an economist, so I have to show you a table of the numbers. And we did just look at the, the basic the treatment effect, that 1.9 that I just showed you from, from the last slide, as well as try to incorporate uh, individual student reporting of effort on the exams, as well as how important they thought this, this survey was. And we also did manage to include some of these, these demographic variables. And the results really didn't go away. So I think the bottom line is that our students learn just as much, if not more, basic mm -hmm. economics content. They seem to have fun in class. And I know I certainly had more fun in class than I did before. So I think with that, open it up to questions for everybody.